Welcome to the Monday morning early edition of Anglican Unscripted, where three guys sit down and talk about three different topics we got today. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's September the 10th, 2018. Okay, guys, this is the second time we tried this format, and uh, the audience, we need to let you know up front, there's technical issues. Sometimes we click the link, it doesn't open up right away, sometimes we have to reboot our computer, sometimes there's speed issues over the pond to get back and forth to England, um, so one of us may become pixelated, George, Kevin, or Gavin, uh, throughout the show, and that's just, we're on cutting edge here. Not the theology, not the news reporting, but the uh, the, the clicking the record, I did click the record button, Whew. clicking the record <laughs> button <laughs> in overseas multi-destination podcast. I uh, want to welcome uh, viewers. Before we get started, even though you haven't liked it, you don't know if you like this episode, you got to click like because you're going to forget at the end of the episode and uh, it'll just go into to Hitherland. Uh, share, please share us with your, your friends, relatives, your priest. If, you, if your priest doesn't watch us, he needs to watch us. Um, comments are really taking off on our YouTube channel. If you uh, get this through YouTube, please uh, go into the comment sections. Uh, I responded to three different comments today already. Um, and subscribers, there's, there's a two-step subscription process with YouTube. One, you click the red button and you're going to get notifications uh, of new shows periodically. If you click the bell next to the new uh, uh, subscribe button, boom, you get instantly notified that there's a new show. And for our <clears throat> highbrow viewers who just listen to us in the car, we do have podcasts, but you have to go to the YouTube show notes to see what's going on. Let's move on to the news. Uh, uh, Kevin, I, yeah. I think we need to ground this more thoroughly. Oh. I don't think any of us are Calvinists, so it's just not going to happen whether we like it or not. I myself am an Arminian, so that you must act. You must make the decision to click at like. Yeah, it's we, your choice. We could so you know, do it's not just going to happen of... anyway because of the providence of God. You have to do this. <laughs> you do. Um, and Gavin, you, did, you didn't mention uh, the saint of the day, which I looked up is Blessed Adolf Copeland. Do you know anything about him? I, I, Kevin, I, I, I don't. I, I was going to offer. I was going to offer years off purgatory for for a like or a share. <laughs> right. Hey, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, that was a joke, folks. Just in no. case anyone. Well, yeah, if people have to understand. I don't think we've ever sat down at eight, 8 a.m. and recorded a show. So George and I are waking up, and Gavin's halfway through the day. So at the end of the show, you're going to think, Gavin was right on. Wow. But Kevin and George, you guys were off today. No, it's just our time zone. We're not awake yet. I'm expecting Mrs. Ashenden to put lunch through the hatch any moment now. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. she knows, she knows it, it is overcooking in the stove. So um, <laughs> if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm brief, that's why. Let's move on to the news. Uh, I, and there's lots of different ways to pronounce her name. Asia Bibi is how I pronounce her name. Uh, finally, somebody has got the gumption to ask an official within the Church of England, what's your stance? What are you going to do? What are you going to do in the future about cases like Asia Bibi? Uh, because there's persecuted Christians in the world, and one of the places they may want to come would be England. And uh, I thought we'd hand this over to Gavin. What was the response? Kevin, there is a wonderful mechanism in England for asking questions of the Second Estates Commissioner in Parliament, and I, I think that uh, people should have access to this kind of conversation more often than not, because it really does seem to be a useful way of making a link between the government and the Archbishop's office via the Estates Commissioner. Uh, somebody in Parliament, one of the Conservative Christian MPs, asked, what was the Church of England doing about Asia Bibi? And the answer basically came back saying, we're so concerned for her welfare that we're determined to do absolutely nothing. Now, they, they, they dressed this up by saying that if we did something, it might go wrong. Uh, but I think uh, I'd, I'd rather hear that from Asia Bibi or her, or her lawyer or her defenders or her community themselves. It's really quite difficult having the Archbishop's office and the Estates Commissioner hold themselves to account in the public space by saying 
the best way of helping this woman is to do nothing. God help me from Christians who, when I ask them for help, say, we've decided the best way of looking after your interests is to do absolutely nothing for you. But George, the, has yeah. that the message been from uh, the Church of England? you got to act on things. Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury gave a, a speech in support of an address in support of persecuted Christian, mm -hmm. Christians at Westminster Abbey that concluded a call for action. You can't just talk about it, you must do something. And when the first uh, incident of doing something came up, Carolyn Spellman, the Second Church of States Commissioner, told, of all people, it was a Belfast Presbyterian who asked this question in Parliament, a member of the DUP, <clears throat> what are you doing to uh, save persecuted Christians? And the Church of England said, well, not much. Uh, we think it's better to talk than actually act. So we, we've had the Archbishop of Canterbury shown up to be a fool by the Second Church of States Commissioner, and if he's not a fool, then he's a knave because he's saying things that he know, knows are not going to be acted on, or he believes that maybe if he wishes upon a star truly enough, you won't have these troublesome Presbyterians from Northern Ireland asking hard questions. It, well, also, this is a, she's a really prominent case now. Uh, ever since she came up and there was an accusation that the Prime Minister herself was uh, part of the response to say and to do nothing, or actually to decline her coming here. We had quite an argument because um, uh, dear Adrian Hilton, who, who who is a conservative politician and very aligned to Theresa May's interests, got cross with people by saying, you mustn't accuse Theresa May of being involved in depriving Azia Bibi of asylum here because she was asked about it. And when faced with comments that the press had said, May herself had refused to help. All May said was, you mustn't believe what you read in the press. Now, if it was true that May had not, if it was true uh, that May had not gotten away, she would have said so. She would immediately have said, I've used my very best endeavors to make sure that any safety this woman needs, we will play a part in providing. There are ways you can use diplomatic and political language to signal very clearly what your intentions are. But simply to say, you mustn't believe everything you read in the press was, was a, a ludicrous way of defending us. Well, no, it's, a, it's a way of saying the press is right, but I'm not gonna admit to it. No, no, exactly so. Now, I'm an American, so my views on this point are, <laughs> are neither here nor there, but what is the point of having bishops in parliament, of having a second church of states commissioner in parliament, if, if they're not going to speak to the moral uh, religious issues affecting the world today. Now, Johnson Tamu has uh, caused a little furore by getting wholeheartedly into the Brexit debate. Um, mm. That's, you know, I, I don't care, but I do care what the church has to say about the persecutions of Christians in Nigeria, in Pakistan. And what does it say? Oh my. And that's all. That's all it says. It, you know, from a political perspective, Justin Welby can now be blamed for the person giving the advice to Theresa May to do nothing. Because if the Church of England doesn't want to do anything, why should the Prime Minister stick her neck out? And I'm now, and now uh, Justin Welby can say, well, I can't do anything because I don't want to undercut the Prime Minister. That's a first. It, it's really a Matthew, Matthew 25. I mean, our Lord is very clear that, that, that uh, when people are in trouble, what did you do? And in this particular instance, it looks like the higher echelons of the Church of England, at the very moment when they had something both practical and deeply symbolic to do, sat on their hands and did nothing. I, I, it appears to me to be shameful, and there hasn't been any defense explaining why it appears to be shameful but isn't. I have to agree. Uh, I, our next story is a, it's a hard story because um, it's kind of a guilty by association. I, and I would talk about gay conversion. And for oh. some people, they think about the Southern Baptists in the 1980s who had you know these gay conversion camps they would send people to. And they were awful. No, they were more than awful. They were God awful. Nobody was using uh, standard psychology uh, practices back then. And these camps were uh, used to use fear and other um, torturous ways to uh, convert. And that was one small time in one small area in one small region of the country. And it gave gay conversion a bad name because now when anybody thinks about that, they think about the Southern Baptists in the 1980s. And that applies to all gay conversion or all conversion everywhere. 
that um, first of all, gay conversion can't be done. If you're gay, you're gay, you're gay. Uh, and um, uh, gay conversion would be evil because it was always evil because of what happened here in America in the mid 1980s. And so I see the Church of England trying to respond to this. I see the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Roman Catholics uh, try to ban the practice of the 1980s to all uh, gay conversion uh, or um, gay ministries. And I thought it's time to talk about it because there's more news now in the Church of England. Um, what's the latest out of the Church of England, Gavin? The Sunday Times, um, with its uh, correspondent Nicholas Helen is pr is producing some very interesting material. Uh, Nicholas is is unbiased. I mean, he's he's he stands in the middle of the warring factions. He just wants news, but he writes quite well about about the news. And this last Sunday, he wrote about gay conversion. Um, he talked about senior bishops in the Church of England being being concerned that gay conversion therapy was taking place despite the fact there was an imminent government ban, government ban. Now there is no government ban. <laughs> they've, they've asked for one and the government are considering it and General Synod, driven by Jane Ozan and her own private interests, uh, limbered up to ask for one. But there is no such ban at the moment and nor is there any definition of what gay conversion therapy means. But of course the problem is that it covers any kind of conversion therapy. Um, now, what is conversion therapy? Well, it's about getting healed by being converted. That's a very the mainline Christian spirituality. Interestingly enough, two bishops in the Church of England, both liberal progressives, Paul Bayes of Liverpool and uh, the Bishop of Manchester, David Walker, expressed some public concern that conversion therapy of some kind is still going on in what they call religious groups. Now, this must be Anglican house groups or parishes or something, because <laughs> that's what Not they're in the talking. Church of England, no. <laughs> uh, well, they're, they're using this dreadful phrase, religious groups, almost as a, an alternative for cults or sects. But actually, um, what they're simply saying is, we suspect that people may be praying in the Church of England to lead a better life. Um, and and they, they give a list of the things they're concerned about. They're concerned about people uh, ranging from private prayer, fasting, fasting, counseling, and deliverance. Well, as far as I'm concerned, private prayer, fasting, counseling, and deliverance are all very important tools in cleaning our act up as Christians, whether, you, uh, whether you're dealing with unwanted sexual uh, attraction or, or, or money or pride or anything else. The problem is that it's now being put it to but all these things are being put together by association in the public space, uh, literally demonizing the idea that if you're going to pray for a purer way of life, whatever it's got to do with, you're verging on the criminal. Uh, as George was saying earlier on before the show, this is this is part of the climate of the neo-Marxist control of ideas and practice, going straight for the jugular for, for Christians looking for holiness. This is totalitarianism. Yeah. This is not only saying you must conform by standards of behavior, but you must think a certain way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think that way, you are either evil or stupid. And the whole, uh, it's an illegitimate, unscientific, illogical, and profoundly unchristian attack on the notion of conversion. Now, Kevin has says there are terrible examples from the past of, of conversion therapy that were misguided and frankly wrong. But there are other numerous uh, successful examples of people who have been delivered from sins and sicknesses and illnesses, not just uh, same sexual desires. And it doesn't mean that but you've laid hands on them and a demon of homosexuality pops out and they're happy clappy from then on. Um, because there is no definition, there's no uh, solid way of s describing what we're talking about. There's a broad, it's what's happening, there's a broad brush, anti democratic, illiberal approach to shut down any opposition to those who are in power or attempting to wield power. I it's way past the issue, it is now into. Uh, theological fascism that we're seeing. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me is that 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 if this illo illogical fascism is directing itself towards what it calls gay conversion therapy, we need to find a better word for that. We really need to talk about, uh, I think, some 
uh, some constraint on Christian appetite. What we're really talking about is, is it's not Christian appetite, what we're really talking about is but the human appetites that the Christian wants to bring to Christ uh, in order to overcome. But, but Gavin, I, I, I agree with you, but at the same time I want to protest that the destruction of language is part and parcel of this agenda. To uh, make things mean what they don't mean, and to destroy meaning, and to destroy a common... We're not, we don't even know if we're talking about the same things, because the language that you and I speak of, of conversion, is one of the gifts of Christianity, whereas the bishops of Manchester and Liverpool are saying one of the curses of Western world and Christianity is conversion. I couldn't agree more. The problem, the problem we have here is of the three words, gay conversion therapy, I'm not particularly worried about therapy. It just means getting better. Uh, gay is absolutely beyond definition, as we know, the moment you put any pressure on it. Uh, and conversion is one of the most precious words we have. So to take one of our most precious words, one of the words that drives the whole Christian appetite for God, and then sandwich it with these two non-words, mix the whole thing up in a, in a toxic cocktail, and then make it illegal, is one of the ways in which we are being uh, constrained and, and confused. And, and George is exactly right. It's part of a very serious attempt by this new cultural fascism to discombobulate, constrain, and to, and, and to, to produce fake news in the public space. I, I was reading last night, yes, I do read, uh, actual a book with paper, not just on a screen. I was rereading Alexander Solzhenitsyn's uh, novel, Cancer Ward. Um, mm -hmm. And I've just struck, now that I'm in it, uh, I read it in college and studied it in Russian classes, and. Where I'm going with this is that the worldview of the Soviet state, the mendacity, the institutionalized mendacity and cruelty and Ill illogicality of the Soviet world is what I see in so much of liberal Christianity and its hierarchies these days. But that's the next step here. In, in, in the times of the Soviet era, they were to hide the dissidents, hide those people. And the dissidents now will be those who are successfully, uh, successfully, successfully converted. I have dozens of friends who've gone through uh, not 1980s gay conversion, but uh, more recent therapies, um, who are just fine, who've uh, no longer have same-sex attraction, or if they do have same-sex attraction, they don't call themselves gay anymore. They're not part of this agenda-driven world, and they have no voice. The church does not speak for those who have been gay converted at all. In fact, they're kind of like people who regret their abortions. They're just, you know, there's just kind of voices in the wilderness. They're out there, but you know, the church isn't here to uh, promote them. The church isn't here to speak on their behalf. The church is not here to use them as an example of godly conversion. And what? So, you know, that's the that's this Soviet era type thing. I think that's right. One of the great traps we're in is that on the one hand, the church is accused quite rightly of not overseeing sexual predators uh, mm -hmm. whose, whose unrestricted sexual appetites cause so much difficulty uh, with, with, with adolescents in particular, but, but essentially all kinds of sexual licentiousness. So in the face of, of sexual predation, the church really should be saying, sex is a problem. We're going to try and find ways of helping Christians constrain their appetites. At the same time, the moment the church says we're going to help Christians constrain their appetites, this secular fascism says, don't you dare direct it towards anything that looks like homosexuality. Even though in terms of sexual predation, 80% um, of, of the paedophilia was homosexual. So the church has been caught I, either way here. And I, I agree with George entirely. One of the things, as I think I've probably said a number of times, I, I, was, I went to the Soviet Union in the 1980s. One of the things that most surprised me and brought me back from a kind of Jungian heterodoxy I was slipping into, into, into to full red-blooded orthodoxy, was smelling the Soviet Union in the air somewhere in the mid, about 2005. And I thought, how, how can I smell this? Why is it coming back? And it's coming back for exactly the reasons that George described. That, that's what's come through the conduits of this secular progressive cultural movement. It's neo-Marxism 2.0, and it intends to both demonize and criminalize people who stand up against it. And as always, it goes straight for the church and the gospel. All right, we have one more topic we talked about in the pre-show. We should move on to that quickly. 
Um, one of the fun thing about having the three of us on is we really delve into these issues uh, a lot more concurrently. Um, let's talk about Michael Burroughs. Uh, who is he and why is he in the news, George? Who? <laughs> I'm sorry. Speak up here. Oh, Michael. Sorry. <laughs> this guy George. from Northern Ireland we were going to talk about. Who? I'm not going to have to edit this. Who's the guy from Northern, the bishop from Northern Ireland who made news? Oh, Michael Burroughs. I said that. That's what I said. said I said Michael Burroughs. I'm trying to think. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, and once again, let us remind the audience there may be technical issues for a show before <laughs> we had our coffee. So let's <laughs> talk about Michael morning. Burroughs. <laughs> it's early morning. My ear itches. Kevin yes, is speaking through his coffee cup. And, <laughs> and, uh, articulation and George's deafness are not technological issues. They're just human handicaps. <laughs> <laughs> <They're> age related <laughs> oh my well, now who is Michael Burroughs now that we've made fun of him and confused his name he's the bishop of uh, Rafo, Killaloo a whole bunch of strung together places on the southeast coast of Ireland he's a Church of Ireland bishop one of the smallest dioceses of the Church of Ireland in terms of people has been appointed chairman of the governors of the Anglican Centre in Rome so what <laughs> well this is probably the most liberal Irish bishop. He's appointed gay, partnered gay clergy to senior positions in his diocese. He made a big stink in Ireland, supporting the votes uh, to uh, uh, legalize abortion, legalize same-sex marriage. He is out there. And, of course, it's times to come, comes time to appoint a new man to oversee the Anglican Center in Rome. And what do we get? Gavin, will you get comments on this? I think one of the things that strikes me most about this appointment is that it plays into this issue about how faithful, how dependable, how gospel is Justin Welby. So the Anglican Centre in Rome is a, it's, it's a jewel in the crown for anyone who aspires to be important in the Church of England. Uh, it's, a, it's a real platform of, of significance and it's it's, it's absolutely certain that any appointment there will have the backing and the agreement of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, if Justin Welby was, as he has often said he is, keen to see Orthodox Christianity promoted, then we ought to expect from time to time either traditionalist bishops or traditionalist deans or just say he couldn't pull that off because the Crown Appointments Commission was too difficult to handle, which isn't the case, but let's just say it. These um, these icing on the cake appointments, which have international diplomatic significance, the fact that George said one of the most liberal, most progressive uh, bishops should be appointed to a situation like this explains very clearly, I think, the, the, the temperament and the mindset and the ambitions of the present archbishop. He appears to be a progressive to the core. And at the end of the day, it doesn't particularly matter in the life of the church who runs the Anglican Center in Rome. It's just that the current Archbishop of Canterbury has adopted a Jobs for the Boys program yeah. of people who support his agenda. And he's establishing a client base and raising up people who owe him favors in return for favors he's given them. And as we look at how the International Anglican Communion is being organized, it's not merit-based by any means. I don't think it ever has been merit-based, but it is politically oriented to uh, protect and further the interests of the powers at the top. I find it ironic, you know, unfettered homosexual desire and practice uh, has basically wiped out uh, Roman Catholicism for the last 200 years in reputation, uh, in structure, in ministry and when asked to appoint somebody to a, a center in Rome that's going to represent Anglicanism we put in position a person who agrees with that practice uh, I, and given, let, let me let me refine I mean I think what you're saying is true but let, can I refine it just a little oh, bit absolutely I often go a little <laughs> over the edge pull me back <laughs> well let, let me let me refine it slightly and say that um, Let's forget the public reputation of Catholicism of the last 200 years because that's a, that's a broad period and, and it has, it's mixed with some real sanctity 
as well as some appalling period. But just at the moment, what you say is particularly true just at the moment. The Roman Catholic Church is facing its own uh, schism with pro-homosexual, pro-permissive people on one side who've been planted there since Vatican II. And the real issue that Roman Catholics face at the moment is which side is Francis on? Is, is he a pretend Pope who's not a real Pope at all, but going to preside over the, the disastrous decay of the Catholic Church? Or is he a, a benign, slightly liberal, touchy-feely man who's trying to make the church more accessible? Whatever pe view people take, the, the Roman Catholic Church at the moment is breaking over the issue of how it deals with sexual appetite and sexual identity. Just at that moment, to put in your most progressive person into the into the most diplomatically sensitive bridge between the Church of England and, and the Roman Catholic Church sends a very clear signal indeed. And as far as we're concerned, it's a diabolic one. It's appalling. And now let's be practical. The Church of Ireland has no money. And this diocese in the south of Ireland is supported by the Anglican churches up around Belfast. So there's no if what I call Trinity Wall Street factor here. We'll give a job to somebody who can pay their way and make everything else happen. There's no money There's no money coming out of Ireland to support this. It's an entirely political appointment to affirm a party in power. And last week, and this is the last record we have of Pope Francis on it, Pope Francis said, if you are a practicing homosexual, you should not be a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. The so, Episcopal Church welcomes you. <laughs> <laughs> there are other places for your ministry. Um, and so I think, you know, the Pope has finally, you know, said, I got to say something. And he said something coherent and doctrinally accurate. Um, and it got very little play in the press. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens. We've guys, I, I want to thank you for getting up early, except for you, Gavin, uh, for our show on, on Monday here. We've come up on about 30 minutes, and that's just about enough for our audience. The number one question in the comments was, we like the three-person format, but don't you dare just do one show a week now. That's, that's you can't do that. So we're going to do one three-person show a week, and we're going to do uh, two two-person shows a week. So I'll still do a show with George. I'll still do a show with Gavin. We'll have special guests uh, uh, periodically every other month uh, with Anglican Scripted. But uh, we're glad you like the new format. I love the new format because these guys are great uh, and bouncing off each other. And they let me speak once in a while, which is so cool. I, just, <clears throat> I have a voice. <laughs> I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you've been listening to episode 462 of Anglican Unscripted. And uh, in the absence of it, my, my, my colleagues telling you it's Monday, the 10th of December. Now, I don't know, people, for those watching the show, you will never see these guys forget the episode again because it's right in the screen, right in front of them. It says Anglican Unscripted 462. And we're going to do that because all three of us are getting older and no, we're no. getting more and more. Yeah, that would require my putting on my reading glasses. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah well, 462. Okay. And the problem with it is my very sophisticated microphone stand is elected and the bar goes straight across where you've written 462. So I can't see it, Kevin. I have to rely on memory. <laughs> A great opportunity to raise some money. If you guys want to donate to Anglican Unscripted so we can buy microphone stands, get reading glasses for George. Uh, buy for George. Buy for George. Anglican.inc forward slash donate. Be generous. 